Welcome everyone to Weekend Wind Down for Interior Designers. I'm Nancy Ganzakoffer, business coach to interior designers, and welcome to my guest today, Jenny Carlson. Cheers, Hi. Jenny. Cheers. What are you drinking? <laughs> I have an IPA today. An IPA today. Okay, you're yeah. a drinker. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so I'm excited about this broadcast. Let me just see if I can get it shared while people are getting notified that we're live because this is going to be an exciting one for me, I know. Hopefully it will be for those who watch. So while I'm trying to share, let me mention that I will not be live with Weekend Wind Down for the next, I believe, two weeks, because I will be at Luann Nagara Live, and I will also be in High Point, North Carolina, for the designer markets. So that will cancel Weekend Wind Down, but I'll try to come on live from there, here, here and there, and just show you what's going on. Okay, let me share in my group and then we'll get going. Share in a group. Okay. What's the name of my group? The Interior Design Business Forum. Let me get that shared. Okay, so I'm really excited to have you on today because you are a certified money coach. Yeah. So tell everyone what that is all about. So a, a certified money coach um, is trained in a behavioral framework through the Money Coaching Institute. And which means I kind of started out as a financial coach, jumping straight into systems and strategies and the, the practical piece of finance. But what kind of separates a money coach is that we look more um, starting with the behaviors around money. So the actions you take and how that kind of plays out in your relationship with money. So going back all the way back to your first money memory and through childhood and until adulthood to kind of see what the patterns tell about where you're at in your relationship with money today. Hmm. Okay, so one of the things that I walk through with my clients when I feel like they have a, a bit of a money issue mm -hmm. it is a similar exercise that I sort of took off of something Anthony Robbins teaches, you know, what's your money story? And I do uh -huh. ask them what they, not their earliest memory, but what memories they have from childhood about money. What did their parents, what are the sayings that their parents used to say around yeah. money, around the household? Yeah. It's something that I, mine were money doesn't grow on trees. People are starving in China. Finish everything on your plate. Mm. Uh, no, we can't afford those designer uh, <laughs> sneakers or jeans. Uh, if you want those, you have to start working. And that's part of the reason why I've been working since I was 11, because I wanted nice things. Yeah. Are those uh, common sayings that people get from their parents? Yeah. I a lot of the money patterns that we have as adults they are defined in childhood so especially like the 5 to 12 year old range whatever happened in that time frame leaves a very significant mark on our relationship with money and it gets stored in the subconscious so if your parents had like a lot of arguments around money or stress at work or there were bankruptcies or divorces or you know success it doesn't matter it can go either in a positive direction or a, a more challenging direction with money but all of that gets stored somewhere in the subconscious and then we grow up and you know we start doing chores or start doing uh, babysitting or little jobs on the side and then go to school and just interaction there and go to college, get our first job, you know, get married, um, start our own businesses. All of those things kind of compound into who, uh, who we are. And our money story. So, yeah. so give me, so what's your money story? So my money story is uh, I, I grew up in Sweden and our family, we used to have dairy cows and we also grow potatoes. So from childhood, 
I was uh, often helping out with my parents to, you know, I, I learned how to drive tractors and milk cows and, oh, wow. you know, sort potatoes, you know, very entrepreneurial. And I learned a lot of skills, you know, in how to run a business and valuing money and also like that you have to work for it. And so my parents taught me a very, a, a very good foundation for valuing money and taking good care of it and making good decisions. And so what made I you kind become of, a money coach then? I think that um, money has always been something that interests me. And I, after college, I graduated as a medical technologist and started working as a cell biology technician at Pitt. Wow. And I stayed there for 10 years but I ended up doing a part-time MBA program at Pitt and realized through that program that I really didn't want to go the corporate route. And instead I started my own photography business and I specialized in pets and their people. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, portraits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I was about three years into the business, I was able to make the jump and start doing that full time. And what I realized in doing that was that the skills that I had and how I had figured out how to make the jump, those were kind of skills that a lot of the women in my network didn't have. Mm. And so I started sitting down with my friends and being like, okay, let's figure out how you can leave your job too. So you can pursue your dream. And it kind of just grew from there. I'm a bit of an anomaly that I'm a creative who loves numbers. And so I understood what it is like to have a creative business that has a lot of ebbs and flows to it. Mm -hmm. And then taking this very like analytical side of me and putting that to work. So it just kind of started expanding and I worked with a lot of photographers and coaches and graphic designers and interior designers. And, you know, I found a way to kind of combine the two. Okay. So tell us when someone comes to you, what for the most part are their issues? What are their pain points? So a lot of times um, they'll come to me and they're maybe two to five years in business and the initial systems and structures that they put in place, they have outgrown or they're starting to feel that they don't have enough kind of structure in place in order to make good decisions around money. Mm -hmm. So I help them to kind of find clarity around their numbers so that they can manage their money with confidence. And I initially, when I got started, because of coming from a research background and the MBA, I started with doing the, the systems and strategies immediately. But I realized that working with creatives, uh, creatives are very internally motivated. Yes. And the, the thought of setting up a spending plan or reading profit and loss statements. Yeah, that's like, oh, no, don't do that. Don't make me look at like my numbers. All, all the resistance uh, just came up from everywhere. And, you know, even from school, a lot of women get told that they're not good at math and they equate that to being bad with money. And that's not the case. So... There, there's a lot of intimidation around money and I really want to empower women to see money as something that you can collaborate with. And so I had to figure out what is in that black box that kind of creates all that resistance. And that's where I, that's when I went and got certified as a money coach so that I could identify if, um, so I use a money quiz and it kind of identifies these different money types and patterns. So whether you feel like you want to just put your head in the sand 
or you put others before yourself, or maybe you're the, the spender who wants to spend without looking what's actually available to spend. Um, but there are also the positive ones who are very, so the warrior, for example, is very disciplined and goal oriented and strategic. And I, I like to see that coupled with another money type that is called the magician which is very trusting and compassionate and generous. Is that the one I came up with when we talked? Was that Yeah, that's how we met. Okay, yes. that's yes. right. That's how we met. I went on your website, mm -hmm. which I should try to share my screen. Um, I went on your website and I took the quiz. Yes. And I came up the magician. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me again what the magician is. <laughs> Well, the magician, um, there are eight different archetypes and the two positive ones. So it all was developed by Deborah Price at the Money Coaching Institute. She looked at both uh, Carl Jung's um, philosophy of archetypes, but also Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, and then identified these different types that comes up when we work with money. And so the, I'll just run through them quickly. Yeah, I want to hear, everyone listen yeah. up. I want to say hi to everyone. <laughs> hi, Lisa. Hi, Jen. Hi, Heather. I'm not sure who else is on, but say hi to us. Okay, we're going to learn about how many eight money eight. archetypes. Okay, eight money yeah. archetypes. See if you yeah. can figure out which one you are. But then so, I'm going to share your website so they can actually find out. Yeah. And um, a lot of these quizzes that we find online they say like about what your personality is and things like that but the the thing that is different about this is that it's not saying who you are but it's saying where you are in your relationship with money so it looks for the the patterns that are currently present in, in that relationship so it, it can depend on the mood you're in the day that you take the quiz or how you feel in relation to money which means that since it's where you are right now when you create awareness around it it can shift so eight different archetypes and one of them is the innocent and the innocent is very common among women it's the feeling of wanting to put the head in the sand this intimidation with money and that we kind of seek security from others. And it's kind of like this, uh, when we feel like we don't know how to work with money. So it's kind of one that is easy to work on once you identify it. So would an example of an innocent be someone who is married and lets their husband handle all the finances because they feel like they're not good at it and they just let them, a woman yes. I'm obviously talking about, or a yeah. man, actually I've met a lot yeah. of men who let their wives handle all the finances also. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. Okay. So then That's you also nice. have, so then the other one is the victim and the victim tends to kind of hold on to a story and it can be something that happened in the past or, you know, uh, they're blaming it on a person. So there's like this benefit of holding on to something um, that keeps them stuck versus moving forward. I know a lot of people like that, mm -hmm. that their money situation is currently because of somebody else, what someone else did to them in the past. Yes. yes. Okay. And then we also have the martyr and the martyr tends to be the caregiver who takes care of others before they take care of themselves. Which and is the definition of a mother half the time. Yes. Okay. Which I have definitely fallen in, I've fold. That's not mm -hmm. even a word. I have definitely fell into that category major mm -hmm. over my lifetime. Yeah. And I mean, it's very common among women and it, it can tend to um, become very self-sacrificing and you kind of build up this, like, just a lot of old stuff that accumulates, you know? So why um, is it bad to, well, I mean, the word martyr is not a great word, but why is it bad to be a martyr? 
with money when you're a mother and you're trying to put your kids first is what I feel like a lot of people would say. I don't think that it, I, I don't think those qualities are bad. It's more remembering to take care of yourself as well so that you don't accumulate resentment and passive aggressiveness and the sort of the negative traits that can kind of percolate underneath. And unless you start to show yourself um, like love and compassion and, and, you know. So there's a balance there. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, so all you martyrs out there, there's a balance. Okay. <laughs> I know. Um, I and, I, and I want to mention that most of the time we have a little bit of all of them. Mm. So they can be passive and some of them can be active. So you want to make sure that the positive archetypes are, are active and the sabotaging ones are as low as possible. And so one that I see a lot is the fool. And the fool is the one that goes and spends without looking what's in the bank account. And so it tends to be a risk ta taker who is a bit undisciplined and restless. Yes. Okay. And yeah, that's not me. Um, but I know, again, people who my son's texting me right during weekend wind down. He knows that's <laughs> weekend wind down. So I'm just texting him back. Weekend wind down. Um Okay, so say the yeah. name of that one again. So that was the fool. The fool. And then and the other um, sabotaging archetype is the tyrant. And the tyrant can be very um, critical and judgmental. And it can either be towards others, but it can also manifest as a self tyrant so that it's more the criticism towards self. And if you're a business owner, that's kind of the fastest route to burnout. So you really want to make sure if you have a strong tyrant to kind of get that in check. So tell me again, though, the tyrant is related. Explain that to me again, because I'm trying to I'm always trying to think. I know people are going, that's me. That's me. And I don't know which mm -hmm. one you are. Jennifer said. She's been the honor. <laughs> Heather said, that's me. And I'm like, which one, Heather? Tell us which one you think you are. And again, I like what Jenny said, is that we all have a little bit of yeah. probably all of them in us. Yeah. Whichever one you probably relate to the most could be coming to more the surface. So tell me about the tyrant one more time. Yeah, so the tyrant can be very critical and judgmental. About? And about money or about others with money. It can be oh. kind of... Um, you know, fearful, and it's just taking more of a... I'm Jen, sorry. Jennifer's like, oh, yeah, I've been a tyrant, too. And I'm, <laughs> thinking, I'm thinking, me, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, have, I have definitely worked through the tyrant, and for me, it's uh, the self-tyrant. So never feeling like I accomplish enough in a day or second-guessing whether it's, you know, good enough and that's kind of where the the tyrant thrives so learning how to keep that one under control okay and so those are all the kind of sabotaging uh, archetypes the good ones then is the warrior which uh, i mentioned is very goal oriented and disciplined and um confident and it's what you think of as the entrepreneur but in order to have a really a balanced uh, relationship with money. You also want to have an active magician, which is the more spiritual aspect of us that is trusting and compassionate and generous. And most importantly, believes that more money is always flowing to us. And I came up the magician, huh? <laughs> I think you, had, you probably had a little bit of all of them. So I, I did, I think. I think I had a little bit of all of them. I don't remember. Yeah. I definitely had the martyr. Mm -hmm. I definitely had the magician. And what was the other one right before the magician? Uh, we talked about the tyrant. but And then there's also the final one is the creator artist, and which I see when I work with uh, creative entrepreneurs a lot. And that's the part of us that is um, internally motivated and very creative. But it also has a drawback if you have 
you only want like a little sprinkle of that one. If you have too many of those patterns active, it starts to become really conflicted around money and has a strong love-hate relationship to money. So you kind of just want to have the positive sides of the creator artist together with the warrior and magician and keep the others kind of at bay. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just cracking up at people's comments. I don't think you can see them, so I'll keep putting <laughs> no. them up. I, uh, I could be all of the above at times, depending on the day of the week. Oh my God, <laughs> me too. That's yeah. what I'm listening to all of these going, yeah, I've been that some days, another day, like, but I think what I like about your quiz is that in the moment in time you're taking the quiz. Mm -hmm. So if you work on your money issues, I don't know if that's the right word, but I could call them hangups, which is probably worse. Yeah. Um, that test, if you go back and retake that test, will you come up different? You'll, you'll come up different at different times, definitely depending on how you feel. Okay. Uh, and so if you're having a, a good day in business, you're probably going to be a lot more warrior, magician, very positive. But if you have a really challenging week, then it could be a lot more victim or fool or, or the innocent. So it's that is so true. And one of the things, you know, I teach sales and marketing and whenever someone says, Oh my God, I just, you know, got a great client. I'm always like, ride the wave. Yeah. <laughs> right? get, yeah. On, get on the phone, dial and smile, connect with people, yeah. ride that energy wave because yeah. I guess one of the positive money archetypes rise to the surface because I'm not a certified mm -hmm. money coach. I really don't know the official terms. And I'm just like, use that energy. And it happens to me too. Yeah. If, I, if I do a webinar and I sell, you know, five courses, I'm like, oh my God, this is great. And I want to teach people more stuff all the time. And then if I have a webinar and I only sell one course or two courses, I'm like, oh, I guess I didn't really connect with people. And I get that whole money, like, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the, tyrant, the tyrant kicks in. The tyrant kicks so like, in. Yeah. Really <laughs> like it's, it's tyrant at myself. Yes. Then it's the self tyrant. The self, but there's also the tyrant that's critical of everyone else spending money mm -hmm. in the wrong way. Yeah. And I mean, the, the quiz only gives kind of a baseline. And that's when I work with clients and we go through these initial steps and what I, we call the core process, um, which happens before we jump into implementation. The core process is really about looking at your, your money history and your money bi biography. And I kind of look at myself as a combination of Sherlock Holmes and Indiana Jones to kind of see if you wrote about your different money memories, what are the patterns that keeps happening through throughout your life until today? And where did they originate? So is it from your parents or your grandparents? Or is it something that you developed as a result of your own life experience? And I mm. think especially in working with women, it's really apparent that we keep repeating the patterns of like our mom or our grandmother, you know, through a lineage until we break those patterns. I can see how they, in working with my clients, how certain patterns keep repeating themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna share a story here that uh -huh. I don't think I've ever shared before publicly. So new story coming guys. So when and i mentioned it like when i was younger and um i was we grew up middle class very nice happy family great parents however you know three daughters money was always <laughs> always an issue and when i wanted jordash jeans and i did, may have told this story once before um and i couldn't get them and i had to we had to buy generic shoes because we couldn't afford you know nice nike sneakers um and my mother made me wear, which I didn't realize until I looked back at pictures about 10 years ago, I wore the same outfit on picture day in kindergarten and first grade. Mm -hmm. One was with red socks and one was the next year was red tights. And I'm like, oh my God, she made me wear the same dress. And it was a dress she made because my mother had sewing machines and would sew most of our clothes. Mm -hmm. But, 
at the point where I was 11, 12, which is right in that time frame that you mentioned, yeah, I wanted some, you know, nice sneakers and I wanted Jordache jeans. And my mother said, well, you know, we, you can't get them. You, if you want them, you have to work. So I started working at, at 11 years old, making miniatures for dollhouses and I would get paid oh, wow. by the piecemeal, which is kind of funny that I am in the interior design industry <laughs> now, no, I'm not an interior designer, but, um, Years later now, fast forward to six years ago, I get divorced and I'm shopping with my daughter and I said, I've never had a designer pocketbook. Mm. I want to buy a Michael Kors pocketbook. And she's, I love this pocketbook. And she's like, so buy it. So I, I did end up, I waited it for, until it was on sale and I had to have <laughs> a coupon, which never comes out for Michael Kors through Macy's. Coupons never come out, but there was a day there was a coupon. So I bought a Michael Kors pocketbook and it was after divorce. And she, my daughter looked at me and she said, why did you never buy a name brand pocketbook when you were with dad? He would have bought you anything. And it was true, but I don't know why I never did. And I, I think after our last conversation is when I put these two things together, like to buy a designer anything, I have to be able to afford it myself. Mm -hmm. It's something I, that was like, I had to earn it. You had to work for it. I had to work for it. Mm -hmm. And trust me, divorce is work, but <laughs> that's not what I meant. It's making a joke, but it was, it was really weird for me to put those two things together. Yeah. That, I mean, that was so, I mean, that was so deeply subconsciously through seeing how your mom was operating with money or, you know, uh, and we we just we take that in, and I love hearing that you had a very strong warrior because you're like if i'm if I want these shoes or whatever, I'm gonna figure out how to make money and get those shoes and so it's interesting to think about throughout like your teenage years and going to college like at what times has that warrior been? present and has it been suppressed at any point so like did something happen so that it kind of got knocked aside a bit so like how how can you then reactivate it if it's not active how has it been suppressed i mean again personally uh, the warrior is tell me the characteristics again just very goal oriented and disciplined and discerning so you know kind of with money so I think that it gets derailed. It did for me when I had children mm. because their, you know, their health, their medical issues, their education all became more prevalent than working and earning and making yeah. money. I did still have my own business, but there were times where it was slower and then faster. And some of those money making goals get put on, you know, the back burner certain, sure. during certain times. But yeah, as soon as the kids were old enough, it was like the warrior came back with a vengeance mm -hmm. <laughs> as it still remains. Um, and it, it's just interesting that tie in. I don't know if anyone else has that can, I think it took me a while to come up with it. Um, Melissa said, mostly a warrior when I take time for myself. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Is that a correlation when you self-care and take time for yourself your true money personality comes out or archetype i think so um when you learn to really empower yourself and you focus on feeling confident with money you kind of work on shifting some of the challenging patterns into empowering outcomes and so that's kind of the end point in this diagnostic process that I work with, sort of identifying which, which are the challenging patterns in play and what would you like them to be instead. And once you shift them, that's usually the warrior and the magician that, that becomes more activated. And how do you help people shift their primary archetype if they're coming in with ones that are not serving them well. Mm -hmm. I take a very holistic approach to sort of befriending finance. I I come up with uh, or 
we come up with a plan together based on the patterns that we've identified and look at which ones needs to shift and what would they want them to shift to. So then we look at practical, emotional, um, behavioral and spiritual types of actions that they can take to make a shift in their life and in their business. So you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? Yes, it's all one-on-one. -on -one. It's all one-on-one, -on -one. okay. And the quiz on your website, I have the, okay, mm -hmm. it's right at the top. I don't know, you guys can't see it too big, but right at the top is what's your money type, take the quiz. It's a little black bar across the top that I'm not, let me see yeah. if I can. And if, I can. You, if you scroll down, you can see it also. Aha, there, there we go. Yeah. I'm showing, we're not on the screen right now, we're just showing the, um, the website. Yeah. So take the money type quiz. Okay. And this, one of my clients now works with you or did work with you. I don't know if she's still with you and yeah. one of my past clients. And she turned me on to this, take the money type quiz. And I was so fascinated by it um, because it is something I work with my clients on in a non-certified way, mm -hmm. uh, unlike you. And it's so fascinating to me. I love this. Befriend finance one step at a time by integrating body, mind and spirit. So does this also help a change my money story? See, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just want to add. Uh, so it's based on Deborah Price book, Money Magic and the quiz that she developed. And so when you take the quiz, I actually send the first three chapters of the book so that you can read a bit more in depth about the different archetypes. I don't know if I read my what you sent me because I know I did it and I'm on your list. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. All right, so what are some of the really, what's, what's a couple of simple exercises people can do if they are definitely identifying themselves in one of the archetypes that may not be serving them well to run their businesses. We are talking to all creative entrepreneurs, interior designers, and people are in the industry. Yeah. What can they do to help themselves? So I think that a good starting point is to kind of get into this really mindful place of looking at what's coming in and what's going out. Looking at their bank account? Yes, as a starting <laughs> point. And that can be terrifying. Uh, I look at my bank account, but again, it did take me a while to really look at it and go, okay, what do I have? And I split up, um, I, I do a, a kind of like mini profit first with my bank mm -hmm. accounts. So- uh, Profit first is something that I, I, I work with my clients as one of the methods and because I, I've seen for myself how much it has helped me in my businesses. And I try to instill those same ideas there. Yes. But I think that if even like if we talk about affirmations that come that we can work with around money, it's important to remember that if you are in a place where you don't feel confident around reading your profit and loss statements, or you don't feel wealthy. Um, like I am wealthy is not going to be a very good affirmation because internally that just doesn't feel right. Immediately, if we say something and we don't believe it, it's just gonna create this uh, dissonance. Yeah, I always had a problem with affirmations when they tell you just to say things mm -hmm. that you don't really believe. Yeah. And I don't remember who taught me a slightly different strategy is to kind of pick a microcosm. Like okay. if I look in the mirror and I say, I am beautiful and I don't feel beautiful, but I can say I have beautiful eyes and mm -hmm. that, that I believe. So it's like a starting point. Mm -hmm. Is it the same? Yeah. yeah, I tend to also like to add like I'm learning so I'm learning how to be good with money or I am um, learning how to read my profit and loss statement so that I can make better decisions. I'm becoming someone who's good with money, you know, so kind of meeting it with where you're at today mm -hmm. and, and 
that kind of gives it a different vibration if we're going to talk about energy. And I mean, money is a form of energy and it, in, an, in and of itself, it's neutral, but we put all of our emotions on it. Yes. Yes. Did you see what uh, Melissa said about your voice? Yes, I appreciate it. <laughs> I know, she's so calm and I'm so hyper. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of want to teach uh, everyone that money doesn't have to be something scary, that we can kind of find a calm with it when we learn to see it as a collaborator. But what happens if you're really facing like you have nothing right now? Like you have no money in the bank, you've had hard times in the past and you just can't get out of your own way of that desperation of, I need to, I need to get more money. I need to get more jobs. I need to say yes to everybody. Mm -hmm. How does that shift for somebody or how long does it take to shift for somebody? That will most likely take a long time. Uh, I don't, like, I don't see money work as a sprint. It's more of a marathon. Mm. And I think that, you have to just start taking baby steps and ask for guidance and, you know, not stay like stuck on your own. I like that actually. I might steal that from you in the future because I feel the same way about building a business. It's mm -hmm. not a sprint. It's a marathon. Yeah. There are times you take baby steps and there are times that you can go faster and it does matter very much what else is going on in your life if you want to maintain some kind of balance yeah i mean money touches all aspects of life and you know the the stresses that we have in our personal life they then get put on our business because the business has to make the money and it, it makes it really important to know how the two interact and how to you know, be able to have the business support your life. Yes. All right. Now we talked about whether we were going to do a live. Okay. I'm going to call it live Oracle card reading mm -hmm. for, <laughs> for me, which makes me a little nervous, everyone who's watching. So what do you think? Yeah. Um, we've talked, yeah, we've talked a lot about, emotions and feelings around money and that's really the the money mindset piece but like when you're changing your relationship with money to make it more empowering you have to look at what actions are you taking uh, to make a, a change so the behaviors that are present and i realized when i worked with creatives that money has become this very intangible Thing in society and how society works today and it can be hard to connect with money um, when you never really hold it in your hands anymore so oh my god it's so true i miss the casinos where you actually put quarters in the machines <laughs> <laughs> and, and take yeah. cash out of the bank instead of doing everything by credit card yeah and so I wanted to develop something tangible that you can hold in your hand and, you know, interact with as a way to kind of figure out what to do next to have an empowered relationship with money. So I'm developing a deck called the Money Compass deck that works with the energy of money that kind of puts you in the driver's seat to to move forward. So if you think of a compass and you're like, if you're going to go sailing and you're out at sea and you can't see where you came from or where you're headed, you need this guiding tool to get you to the destination. So this deck is kind of designed in the same way to when you feel lost in working with money, like how can you then ask a question and get this kind of prompt on what to do next. Oh, and that's what we're going to walk me through. Mm -hmm. Okay. But first I want to, I'm going to post Sharon's comments because it's really um, interesting. It's going to block us from the screen because it's a long message, but it's worth posting. If it will let me, will it let me? Oh, it might not. Oh wait, I got it. 
Okay, so I know it's blocking us from the screen, but read that. Yeah, created problems in relationships. And she yeah, the it. money money equals struggle, and it makes it something that you don't really want in your life if you've only seen the negative aspects of it. Right. Thank you for sharing that with us, Sharon. Yeah. That you know, I think, and I think that's a lot of people. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, it's a ton of people. So I'm I'm so glad she shared that with us. You know, one of the things that I asked, um, one of the questions I ask my clients when they're struggling when I can tell they're struggling with money issues also is what do you think of very wealthy people? Mm -hmm. and again, the reason why I ask that is because when I was listening to Tony Robbins do this money story lesson years and years ago, I had to pull my car over and I sat there and I got welled up because I realized I had such a negative connotation of people who had a lot of money that they were obnoxious and pompous and demanding and, you know, downright mean sometimes. And I thought, wow, like I, never realized that that was in my head and was holding me back from uh, charging my worth. And now I actually wrote a chapter in a book for Luann Nagara's new book um, about charging your worth because I have worked so hard on my money story. Yeah. And I came home and I asked my son uh, the two questions, you know, what do you remember dad and I um, – talking about around money, like what sayings did we have? I don't remember the answer to that one, but it wasn't too, it wasn't bad. And then the second question, I said, what do you think of very wealthy people? And he said, they work really hard. They're really smart. And I know I can always make money when I need it because I watched you and dad do it throughout the years. And I went, oh, good. At least I didn't screw up my kids. <laughs> so at least the one. I didn't ask the other two yet. I don't think you, I did. you set a good example. Yeah, apparently it didn't matter what was going on in my head. On the outside, I relayed the right thing. So I was mm -hmm. happy about that. Um, so but I think that was because you were working on your money story and you were shifting it. You were working actively on that. Yes. Yes. The cutest story, though, was the day, um, I don't remember which one of my kids said this, but we wanted to buy as a family something that was pretty expensive. And um, we were, my, my husband and I at the time, we were debating, like, should we get it? Should we not get it? And one of my kids went, don't worry, just put it on dad's business. Because <laughs> the perception that we taught our kids was that if you put it on the business, it doesn't cost anything. Right. <laughs> and we were like, no, it still costs money. And it's only mm -hmm. if it's related to the business. Like, it was so funny. We didn't realize we were giving that message. Yeah. So it, that's a funny. That's still a funny family story. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because the, I, I think that happens a lot, that we take really good care of the business and you know, you invest in yourself and in the success of growing the company. But then on the personal side, it can be a completely different story that if you don't feel comfortable in paying yourself until the business is doing well, then it becomes that the you're holding on to money and kind of starving yourself personally. So like bringing that into balance by having like, a plan for how to compensate yourself as you grow more and more accustomed to that. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. All right. Are we going to do my, are we going to do my card reading? What do you call it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, what question do you have for money or for the energy of money? Do you, do you guide me in asking a question or do I ask anything random? So, my my general recommendation is that whether you're working with an oracle deck or if you're using tarot, you don't want to be asking yes or no questions. Oh. So it wants to like think of yourself in the driver's seat when you're asking this question. Okay, I'm driving. Yeah, and if you're thinking of money as a 
neutral entity, that kind of puts the two of you as partners in this relationship and that your your money is coming along for the ride. And if you're asking money a question, then what would that be? If I'm asking money a question, what would it be? All right, help me out, guys. Give me a question. Okay, wait. Right, let me, <laughs> money's money's driving along with me. Mm -hmm. and, and you're ask, you're kind of asking it for guidance on like what to do next or you know. Ah, this is tough. I thought I could just like, will I have enough money to live the rest of my life? Kind of question. Um, this, you, this, you can. Yeah, the, the shift to that question would be how, what would be the next step in order to set me up so that I have enough money to uh, Okay, that's my question. What would be the next step in mm -hmm. order to set me up to have financial security? Mm -hmm. uh, in the next 20 years. All right. That's a great question. <laughs> Good, you gave it to me. <laughs> but that is, that is actually what my question would be. Like, I want to be financially independent. You're ripping out a whole bunch of stuff. What are you ripping? I'm just, uh, I'm actually. Oh, you're, you're I'm shuffling. Sh I'm shuffling. Oh, okay. <laughs> shuffling. Yeah. Okay. What's, so what is this going to tell me? The answer to, to what I need to do next to set myself up for. I don't ever want to be a burden on my kids. I never want to be financially reliant on anyone else. I want if you know if I want to be with somebody, I want to be with someone not for money reasons. So mm -hmm. that's why the basis of that question. All right. Oh, I'm afraid to see the answer. Somebody hold my hand. Okay. <laughs> so the, the answer is detach. Detach. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So detaching is usually that we need to detach from money in terms of making sure that we're not chasing it. And because if you're running after money, running will, or money will generally just keep running away from you and not being something that you can catch. So if you can already envision that you have that security, that it's a given, then the energy that you put into your sales conversations and how you interact with uh, ideal prospective clients and, you know, will be neutral and confident instead of this like hunt and gather for, for clients. I think I, I think I've made that shift, but maybe not deep enough within me because when I talk to clients, it's really all about helping them. And if they yeah. don't end up signing with me or buying my course or anything like that, I'm like, all right, it's not what they need right now. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help them anyway. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if that's not deep enough that it's still coming out as not a full detachment. It could be that you, you're already working on that and that you just keep to keep maintaining that mindset. Okay, so I have to keep I, working on that. I would agree with Melissa. I totally see you as a warrior. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not worried. I think you're you're set. We it's just and I think it's such a beautiful reminder to just be serving from a neutral place. Be serving from a neutral place. And again, truly, I believe I do that, but probably deep down, I still have a little bit of that attachment mm -hmm. to watching the numbers too closely, yeah. to be perfectly honest. Like I'll watch the numbers and go, oh, you know, maybe this month's not going to be as good as last month was or something like that, as opposed to just keep giving authentically and what yeah. it's supposed to be will be. Yeah. And, and trusting that more money is always flowing to you. Okay, more money is always flowing to me. Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it's, flowing. it's it's on its way. It's on its way, it's coming. Okay, everybody, share my broadcast. Okay, so Rebecca asked, how can I have you more of you money in my bank? I'm not sure I understand, Rebecca. Jenny, do you? No, that would be a, 
a good question. So like, what could she do so that she could have more money in her bank account? So she was helping me with a question. Mm -hmm. So if I, oh, you're or, like, or, or was it a question for her? Is Rebecca weigh in if you're still here? Love to know if that's a question for you. Can you do these readings? I could do, I could pull her a card. Oh my God. Okay, Rebecca, are you still here? Type quickly. Hit enter. I want to see who wants to ask a question. We have a couple more minutes left. Um, yeah, so I'm still developing it, and this is it's basically my chicken scratches on the these uh, this prototype cards. But it, I'm using the kind of researcher approach to it to really work with the deck, and I'm writing the guidebook to go along with it, so that the designs are then. Um, made as a, as we go along. Okay, so Rebecca said yes. Okay, so that's okay. that's her question. All right, let's put her question up. So how can I have more of you, meaning money, in mm -hmm. my bank? So mm -hmm. let's see what her card comes up with. Oh, I love this. I could do this all day. <laughs> it's super fun. It is fun. And it's really about tapping into your intuition and that inner voice so that you can kind of get internal guidance on what to do next based on the card. So let's see what comes up. I do think mine was right on, by the way. I do. Good. All right. Uh, for Rebecca, how to have more money in, in the bank is begin. Put that a little closer to the camera. Begin. Oh, Rebecca, does that radiate with you? So it's really about starting to not hesitate in moving forward. But like, what is the smallest step you can do to, to begin to move something forward, just to move the needle? Yes, because a lot of people get stuck in the perfectionism yeah. and Absolutely. being in fear of it not working out and they don't they don't move forward. Yeah. Okay. Are you okay doing another one, Jenny? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I don't want to overstep my bounds. If I'm overstepping, no, I know you're... I'm, I'm having fun. Okay. I know you're very <laughs> polite, but you have to tell me no more, Nancy. Okay. So Sharon, mm -hmm. how can I use you money to serve, to serve others? You know, they know how to ask the question so much better than I do. <laughs> I love this. But we're, we're on the spot. So <laughs> That's <you> right. <laughs> Okay, for Sharon, how can I use you money to serve others? Great questions. Yeah. I know Melissa's trying to figure out a question right now, too. All right, the answer for Sharon is... <laughs> I, I, we got detached again. We got detached again. Okay. Okay. Rebecca said thank you, but I don't know if Rebecca's radiated with her. So I'm curious, Rebecca, if you felt like that radiated with you. Okay. Sharon. And I'm curious what if it, if my interpretation didn't um, sort of feel right, what came up intuitively for her? For Rebecca. Yeah. Okay, let's see if she's able to answer. Okay, so Sharon. So I think detach in this sense, if it's to use money for others, the detachment has to come from like, you're not taking away from yourself by giving to others. How can I use money to serve others? So say that again. I was thinking of it in terms of giving. So if you're giving money to others, there can still be enough for you. See, I'm looking at it like how can how can how can I use money to serve others? I mean, I I again, I look at it from a different perspective, but I think that you're using money to serve others by putting yourself out there and using the tools you have in your business as an interior designer. And you're using 
<laughs> you're using their money to serve others. It's an exchange of energy. Absolutely. And not having any guilt over that because money is an exchange of energy. Yes. So that's kind of the way I interpret mm -hmm. it. Um, I love it because I, I think it it's, this is part of it to kind of co-create what it means and to all kind of tap into our intuition. Feeling a little psychic right now. Okay, let's see. Uh, Sharon said, okay, I think I can see that. Uh, maybe feeling like you need to have enough before you can give to others. Yeah. And that is, yeah. you want to give, you want to give first and the money will come. Correct. Yeah. I think uh, you have to view it so that it's like, you can't give so much that you don't have anything left over for yourself, but you can always, even if you can only give a little, then just setting that aside and just trusting that more is coming. Okay, Melissa did come up with one, but I'm not sure it's related to, because I already gave her the answer to this one. <laughs> How can I say no to clients I don't want to work with? Uh, I'm not sure that's a money. So you could, could you rephrase it to how do I only attract money from clients that align with me? That's a good one. Can we answer that one? Mm -hmm. okay, we reframed your question like we reframed mine. Oh, see, now Rebecca is weighing in while you're shuffling. Cool. I have a lot of ideas, but afraid to start or ask. So begin is really my answer. And I do. Oh. Yay. I love it. I love it too. <laughs> Sharon said, right. And Melissa's laughing. <laughs> As we answer how she can attract money from clients she actually wants to work with, if that's the way we worded it. Here comes the magic <laughs> and the card. So how, how to attract more and how, how to attract money that uh, comes from aligned clients. Yes. Um, the answer is ask. Oh, so how are we going to interpret that? She has to be talking to her ideal client on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And also, I think visualizing, like asking, it could be asking the universe for the type of person she's looking for. Like, how can she identify what what does the ideal client look like? So I help me find the XYZ type client that values these things or, you know, some of, part of it is, and sometimes we think that we have to do all of it, but sometimes we have to be able to verbalize what we're looking for and to then, the, <laughs> here comes detach again, but detach from how it's going to come to us. Cause then you're also kind of leaving it to the, the universe that it is actually there to support you. I love this because I, again, I, I say it in just completely different ways. You say it in a much more educated way when it comes to the certified money coach side, but I always say, take the actions and remove yourself from the pain and the fear and just take the actions and that it will come. Yeah. And it takes time. Um, so what a fun session this was. <laughs> yes, I had such a great time. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I had a great time too. I hope everyone watching had a great time and you share this broadcast. I think this is so important. I, I truly believe that almost everyone I know has something, some kind of a money hang up story issue that they can work on. But I, I'm also a believer in consistently learning and growing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
um, Sharon said, it's like put yourself where they are and just ask. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And um, simple. But we all make it so complicated. We really, really do. And we That's try. True. I always say interior designers' jobs are so complicated in the job itself. Everything's so detailed oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, don't make the business model complicated. And now this is also don't make making money and attracting money complicated. Keep it simple. So Jenny, tell everyone how to find you. I know I shared your website, but tell them. And then after the broadcast, please go into the comments and put your links in there for whatever. Yeah, I will. Yeah, so uh, you can go to financialsforcreatives.com and um, I'm usually on Instagram uh, daily and uh, you'll find me there at financialsforcreatives. Financialsforcreatives.com and financialsforcreative on Instagram. I don't know if I follow you yet, but I'm definitely going to do that. Yeah. So everyone have a great weekend. Again, I think I'm going to be gone from Weekend Wind Down for two weeks, but I'll try to go live from Luann Nagara live event where I'm one of her authors and we'll be up on stage two and a half days with about 200 people um, speaking about our chapters. Uh, my chapter is about charging your worth. So this is perfect timing. Yeah. Just to add to what I've already written about in that book a week after that, I believe I am in High Point, North Carolina for the uh, designer markets. And I'm making two presentations there, networking like a rock star. And I'm doing another session where it's literally live business coaching. So it's open to like 20, 25 people. If you have an RSVP, and I'll be sending out an email this weekend with the link so you can RSVP where I'll be just off the top of my head, live business coaching to help you grow your interior design business. Perfect timing, my dog is barking. So thank you, Jenny, so much. Thank you, Nancy, this was wonderful. Wonderful, all right, guys, have a great weekend and I'll see you in three weeks. If not before, if you're going to one of the events. All right. Bye. Bye.